Hi everyone. Um, I'd like to welcome you to Conversations to Promote Inclusive Economic Competitiveness. My name is Emily Scott and I'm with Local Initiative Support Corporation, or LISC. We're a national community development institution that helps connect resources to communities. So whether you're on Zoom or Facebook Live, appreciate you taking some time to join us this afternoon. Um, I'd like to just first kind of start off to thank our partners in Empower and the Indianapolis Recorder for partnering with us on this event and inviting us to be a part of this series. Um, their work behind the scenes to co-host and promote and share information with their networks um, has been a huge asset to our partnership and just appreciate working with them to kind of craft the, the vision for this series of events. This is actually our second session in our first Friday's a series of conversations to promote inclusive economic competitiveness that's really aimed at connecting community entrepreneurs with resources and social capital and technical assistance and other programs to help them grow their business or start their business, whether they be in real estate development or uh, offering a product or a service or some other type of business. In April, we uh, featured speakers from Sanair, ISBDC, which is the Indiana Small Business Development Center, the Urban Land Institute, Bankable, and LISC to talk about a range of financial resources um, that are available to small businesses that um, you know, can help them grow. And so this is really kind of building off of that, uh, that first workshop in the series to, you know, further build upon each of those kind of resources. I would just like to point out that I'd encourage you guys to keep an eye out on social media or newsletters or however you connect with LISC and Enna Power and the recorder for our upcoming sessions on June 4th and July 2nd. Um, for people that attend each of the four First Friday sessions, they can qualify for enrollment in InnoPower's Emerging Entrepreneurs Cohort. So stay tuned for more information on from InnoPower about that. So today we um, have invited a series of panelists to join us um, to really just kind of hone in further on, you know, what are some of the resources that exist to help further refine a business plan to get into product development or prototyping uh, for businesses that might be uh, developing some type of product, um, thinking more about planning for marketing and growth, and then ultimately thinking about real estate needs for the business. We're fortunate to have a really awesome set of speakers with us today that either work in an organization that offers some of these products or, or um, programs or services for businesses. Um, and But a lot of them are actually small business owners, either current or past themselves. So they've been in your shoes. They have um, you know, experienced a lot of these processes and programs and some of the challenges of entrepreneurship personally. So I think they all have a really great perspective, both personally and professionally on entrepreneurship and small business development. So first I'll just go ahead and introduce each of our speakers. So we have Dr. Rhonda Taylor, the department chair of business and entrepreneurship at Ivy Tech. And we have Emmanuel Ivy, senior director of workforce development and entrepreneurship at Edna Martin Christian Center. We have Kyle Squillis with uh, the Purdue Manufacturing Extension Partnership. He is a technology acceleration specialist. And then Catherine Esselman, Senior Project Manager with Develop ND and Indian Chamber. So each of our businesses will spend about five to seven minutes um, sharing some resources and programs that their organizations or their departments or their programs offer that are really um, focused on small businesses and, and helping them grow. And then I might ask each of them also to, um, for those that have been entrepreneurs in the past or currently are small business owners now, or to maybe just share quickly, you know, what, what type of small business venture they've been involved in personally too. So after they spend some time kind of covering those things, then um, we'll come back and I'll ask each panelist a few different questions just to, to dive a little bit deeper and hear some, um, some other perspectives. And then we'll open it up to you all to ask questions and have a facilitated conversation. So in the meantime, feel free to drop your questions in the chat or any comments, and we'll work to incorporate those as we go. So we'll first um, kick it off to Dr. Taylor. Thank you so much, Emily, for having me today uh, on this panel. Really appreciate it. And hello and welcome to all of you out there for this Friday conversation. Um, I'd like to talk to you a little bit about, you know, what we have to offer here at Ivy Tech. And first, I'll give you a little background about myself. So I've been at Ivy Tech for a little over 14 years. 
Um, I am a, I was a small business owner. Actually, I am currently. I started off with um, a daycare, in-home daycare that I ran for 10 years and um, a lot of struggles, a lot of high points and, and low points, but um, I understand <laughs> a lot of the various aspects of, you know, getting a startup, you know, up and running and going, but I'm very successful over 10 years. And um, because of my competing demands with Ivy Tech, went ahead and closed it down, but I do miss my babies. Um, actually, some still live here in the neighborhood, so I see them often. Um, I currently have a, um, <clears throat> a business called um, Not Your Norm Camp. And right now we're on hiatus because of the pandemic, but basically we teach tweens on how to um, start a business. And we also expose them to unique professions as an alternative to mainstream, you know, professions like doctor, lawyer, teacher, those types of things. So it was thematic. So each time we have a camp, it's something different. Last time it was photography. This next time it's going to be filmmaking. Um, we're going to do social media another time. So we do a lot of different things. It's a week long and, you know, it's really fun for that. So those are a few things that I've done. Um, at Ivy Tech, we have a, a comprehensive entrepreneurial program where um, anyone can come in and in three classes, you'll have a certificate, but more importantly, you will have the skills that you need to actually start your business. So in those three courses, um, we teach you how to network. We teach you how to get your resources. We help you actually build your ecosystem. So that when you're done with us, you have, you know, a platform to step out on. So that those the ecosystem consists of the different resources, the individuals, as well as entities that help in small business development. Um, your faculty member serves as your business coach. And so we actually meet you where you are and help to get you to that next level in your business. And if you're ready, by the time you graduate, we actually help you launch. And so it's really nice to launch while you're with us at Ivy Tech because you're kind of doing it a soft launch under the protection of us with those resources on hand to actually help you go through, you know, any issues that you may have. We always say that failure is an option. And if you're going to do it, you should do it quickly <laughs> so that you can learn from it, you can pivot and you can grow. And so to fail in a safe space like Ivy Tech um, is what we're, we're going for. You know, we don't want you to fail, but if you're going to do it, do it now so that you can, you know, learn and pivot from it. Um, some of the other things that we expose our students to is, um, you know, putting together your business model canvas. We actually have that as a step before actually doing your business plan. There's so many great things that go into that and you can build off of that and then build your business plan. But, you know, many of our students will actually launch before they even start their business plan because we need to have traction. We need to see where their expenses are going to be. We need to see if this is an idea that's actually going to work. And then when they're ready to scale and receive, um, you know, investors or maybe even a bank loan, then we help them put together that business plan so they can be successful with that. We um, pair our students up with a mentor. This is someone that is in the community and someone who has either expertise in the industry that they're in or has expertise in something specific that they need. So maybe it's finance, maybe it's marketing, maybe it's how to build a team. And so they may have one or two or three different mentors that will help satisfy those different things. We try to match them up as early as possible so they can really um, create that relationship. And then hopefully once they're done with Ivy Tech, they can continue that relationship with their mentor long-term for as long as is needed you know, for them to be successful. I know that it's college, but <laughs> our entrepreneurial courses are not your typical college course. So we, we teach mindset. And one of the things is we have to get out of mindset that I'm going to go to class and I'm going to do a paper five minutes before class just so I can get the point, check the box and, and those types of things. We try and let our students know this is your business. This is your livelihood. So this isn't a class you're coming to. It's your board meeting. It's your team meeting. It's your business that you're opening up at nine o'clock a.m. on a Thursday morning. And so, you know, you really need to think of it like that. And we don't teach it like it's a regular college course. So, you know, sometimes it throws people off because they're expecting a lecture and an exam and to read three chapters. And that's just not what well, we don't have a book. <laughs> we have resources for you. And um, the, the, the lectures is more so tell me about what you experienced. Tell me about the surveys that you did. Tell me where you need help in your business. And so those are a lot of things that we do in the classroom to help you actually um, get your business started. A lot of the students, as they go through, will end up in different places. It's because they have different businesses and different needs, and that's okay. We actually, you know, want that to happen, and so you'll you'll find that out a lot. We also have opportunities for funding, so we have a couple of different opportunities. One is a very fun one; it's an Ivy Shark Tank that we have. 
And this is actually open to every student at, at Ivy Tech, so not just the entrepreneurial students. So you get an opportunity to meet with some experts that will help you put together a pitch. And then, of course, you participate in that pitch competition. And if you win, then there's money involved that you can get and use in your business however you like. Um, even if you don't win, the, the experience is really rich because the people that we bring in to help you are folks that charge, you know, $500 an hour to help someone put together their pitch. And so these are professional individuals and they're helping people that are going after, you know, millions of dollars in financing. And so you get that experience plus the the networking that you have in the room there. And then the opportunity, of course, to display your company um, in, the, in the public, maybe sometimes for the first time. And so some advantages there, even if you don't win. Then we also have built into the class where you can actually pitch to actual investors. And those investors then will give us feedback on your pitch, give you feedback as well, and tell us whether or not they would invest. And if so, how much, and if not, why? We give that feedback to you. And if, if, if there's an investment to be had, then um, we actually help invest in your company for that. And again, you use that towards you know, your startup costs. Um, and so we are fundraising to help put some real money in the pockets of our students um, to make that startup a little bit more successful than if they didn't have that capital. Um, so again, comprehensive ecosystem networking, um, three classes over two semesters and, and you can be done with your startup and, and launched in, in the community. Great, thanks so much for giving that overview and just um, talking about how it's a little bit different than your traditional educational experience and then some of the, the benefits of the program, including some of those uh, potential financial resources for businesses. So that's really great. So now I'm gonna hand things over to Emmanuel Ivy to also talk about this other community-based entrepreneurship program and just some of the services that they offer within their organization and, and their approach to supporting small businesses within the community. All right. Thank you, Emily. Uh, I'd like to thank the Indianapolis Recorder, uh, NO Power, and LISC for um, having me on. Um, welcome, everyone. Um, first, I kind of talk about me first. Uh, I am a serial entrepreneur. Uh, in college, I had an entertainment and um, advertising company uh, in which we threw parties on campus, off campus. Uh, we hosted rap battles, um, basketball tournaments, and we actually um, did a turkey drive for the community of Terre Haute uh, for three years. So very, very proud of that. Um, also, uh, after graduation, I started my um, consulting company, Value Faithful Solutions. And at the time, it was just you know business development and or coaching, but I have expanded my services with uh, grant and proposal development and also uh, program development. Um, with that, um, at my former employer, Jobs Partnership, I, uh, at the time, was a um, jobs coordinator and helped individuals uh, find employment. But there, I started an actual business development program in which all of my siblings and my cousin um, joined, in which we formed um, Ivy Spice International Food and Catering, and also purchased the food truck truck who's your fat daddy bus cafe so um i've i've been doing you know, entrepreneurship work um, roughly since about 2008 and you know, just want to continue uh forth now let's talk a little bit more about our micro enterprise uh, program here at the edna martin christian center so uh, we have a, uh, it's, it's not a cookie cutter type program. So there are um, different tiers uh, within entry. So our tier one um, is for the individuals who just have an idea of business. You know, they have no uh, business experience. Um, they just you know, want to start a business. Then we have our tier two, in which those are the individuals that actually have a business, but it's informal. Um, so they don't have a, um, uh, they haven't registered with the Secretary of State. They uh, don't have an EIN number or a business bank account but they do have customers and they are making money. So turning that informal business and formalizing it. Then we have our tier three. Uh, those are the businesses that have been in existence for let's say one to three years, um, still making less than 50 or $20,000. And they're really uh, in need for capital, but also they're in a crossroads. You know, should I go back into the workforce or should I stick this out? Then we have our tier four in which those are the uh, businesses that have been in existence existence for let's say well over five years. Uh, they're making over fifty hundred thousand dollars a year and we're looking more towards those uh, businesses to be the mentors to our tier ones and twos. So with that uh, we have our free business training 
uh, FREE is an acronym for Fostering Relationships, Endeavors, and Enterprises, in which we help individuals develop their business plan, uh, but also their, uh, their pitch for their business. Uh, we do have a quarterly microenterprise uh, pitch contest in which um, the winners will receive uh, $500 worth of seed funding, uh, also QuickBooks, but then we will uh, also provide um, accounting services for them as well. Um, so that, that program is, uh, is primarily for our tier ones and twos. So develop the business plan, but also your pitch for your business. Then we have what we call our uh, business growth forums. Um, this is more uh, of higher level type information for our tier threes and fours, uh, in which everybody can, can join. But uh, if you've been in business, you know, this information that, that we're providing will definitely um, help you sustain. Um, also, last year we started our SWAT This 19, uh, excuse me, SWAT This COVID 19 uh, virtual town hall. And, you know, as we all know, the, the pandemic is here. And, you know, we wanted to look at, you know, what are entrepreneurs, um, you know, how are they pivoting, you know, what types of um, services or products um, have they shifted to, you know, while they're in uh, this pandemic. So we actually had um, current entrepreneurs that are in our program and then ones I know as well um, as panelists. So, you know, they can get a, a good understanding on, you know, startups, but also, you know, existing businesses, how they pivoted, you know, through this pandemic, excuse me. Um, additionally, we have uh, financial and, and capital uh, workshops for individuals that may be interested in, you know, how to get a small business loan or, you know, what types of, you know, micro lending programs are out there, um, sort of like, like Kiva, um, but also other additional, you know, apps and uh, just, just agencies that help, you know, entrepreneurs. So we have those uh, twice a year. We'll have one here in the summer and then also one in the fall. Um, we have teamed up with uh, KSM um, accounting firm in which they will assist us with, um, uh, with basically doing um, a foundations of how to work uh, QuickBooks. Um, so they, they are sponsoring a QuickBooks software to our entrepreneurs and you know, we definitely want them uh, to have the understanding of how to utilize that software and how we can benefit and sustain um, their businesses. Um, also, we work with youth, um, 14 through 18 years old, that are actually in school. So we have our YES uh, business development program, and YES is an acronym for um, Youth Entrepreneurship Secrets uh, and Solutions, uh, in which we help um, you know youth in middle and high school. Uh, we know and understand that um, all of them won't you know want to start a business, but at least we're you know providing that exposure to them. So uh, if one day if they feel that you know college might not be formed and or the workforce, they at least have the information, the knowledge um, to start a business. So, you know, those are all the services um, that we offer. Um, our services are free. Uh, and also we do work with a lot of other um, different uh, community partners and, you know, like an Ivy Tech as well. So, you know, if, if we can, you know, serve you um, uh, to, to, to your capability or to our best capability, then we definitely will uh, re uh, refer you out to uh, our other community partners. So I'm just thankful for the opportunity to share about the work that we do. Um, also, uh, I forgot to mention that we are, uh, we will be opening our Community Solutions and Entrepreneurship Center uh, in June. Uh, that, that's at our second campus, uh, at our leadership and legacy campus off of 23rd and Ralston. So that um, location and, and that facility will be solely for entrepreneurs. That's exciting. You'll have to make sure we uh, get the invitation to that. So yeah. one thing I was going to invite all the speakers to do quickly, if while we're talking, if you happen to have a link to your program or that you're referencing, feel free to drop it in the chat so that folks can grab that and then We'll also try to send that out via email afterwards, but just so that folks can grab things here while they're while they're uh, ready. So, um, so I think you know, with both of the the programs and services that Rhonda and Emmanuel mentioned, it's really for any entrepreneur, right, regardless of business. And then you have certain um, you know programs or resources that might be more relevant to you know, depending on what industry you're in or what you're doing. So that's why I wanted to bring Kyle in to specifically talk about prototyping and production. So, you know, for businesses that are potentially creating a product or, um, you know, needs some type of engineering assistance or figuring out how to turn an idea in their head into a physical product, how do they go about that? And, and what are the resources out there for that? So I'll hand, hand it off to Kyle now. Great. Thanks, Emily. Uh Pleased to be here and, uh, and speak with all of you today. <laughs> so I'm currently with Purdue Manufacturing Extension Partnership, but majority of this uh, little 
um, spiel will be on my past history. And that was with working with a lot of startups in the hardware uh, product development world. So we were a job shop, model shop, proto prototype house where we physically made a lot of the first physical prototypes that people uh, had of their designs. Um, I heard Shark Tank earlier, we had a couple projects end up on Shark Tank. So when people need something to demonstrate, you know, how it works, to pitch to investors, to uh, whether it's Kickstarter or to, um, you know, a board of investors, they need something tangible, right? And it needs to look good and it needs to work. And so depending on what stage folks were at, they would call on us to help them with those exercises. So, you know, I would say that, you know, today is as good a time as any to be uh, an entre entrepreneur in the product development world, meaning that it's it's more accessible and more affordable than it's ever been because the te technology has gotten so much better. The software that's available for free or very little cost is incredibly powerful uh, compared to what it used to be. So there are resources out there. Um, I would say you know networking is still going to play a huge role into what you do, and even if it's not the first and just quickly on networking, if it's not that first networking connection you make, it, it's probably that second or third degree. So it's somebody, a friend of a friend, that kind of a thing. Um, so don't be discouraged if you don't meet somebody that's your investor, that your dream investor, that first, you know, uh, networking event you go to, that's probably not going to happen. But you, it's up to you to follow up with that person and get introduced to their network. And that's kind of what LinkedIn is. And everybody knows that. But but it's important to reiterate that physically it, it, in, when events start happening re with regularity again, that it's up to you to, to do the follow up and be persistent and don't be afraid to ask for you know, those leads. Um, so getting back to the product development world, um, you know, maker spaces are a great place to start. Uh, and then at the university level, I'll throw them in as well. Uh, Purdue has a, a great network as far as the, the regional polytechnic campuses that they, they want to work with community entrepreneurs who need help developing that product. Um, whether they want student help or not, they may have a lab that has, you know, it's full of 3D printers, it's full, it has a laser, it has a metal shop, it has all these incredible tools that I had, some of them are exceeding what I had in private business, it's amazing. Uh, and a lot of times these are very underutilized. So talk to the director, talk to the faculty there, and they will, they more often than not, they will make it an accommodation for you that is very affordable and reasonable as whether it's, you know, an in-kind contribution where you could maybe even teach something in exchange for use of the lab. It doesn't even have to come, come out of your pocket potentially. So I would encourage you to reach out to any of the Purdue Polytechnics uh, I know there's some similar arrangements with other universities I'm just not as familiar with, but that's a great place to start if you've kind of gone the makerspace route as well. But, uh, you know, 16 Tech and some of these other makerspaces that are available around central Indiana are great places to go. Um, we talked about failing earlier. I'll say, yeah, it, you know, it's only a failure if you don't learn from it, right? And so, like somebody said yesterday, I was at a 3D printing conference uh, for the past few days. It was awesome. But guy had he's since retired but he says I'm the smartest guy in the room I know that because I've made the most mistakes hands down and he wasn't afraid to admit it and that's it's really true so you'll fail you'll fail fast fail cheaply <laughs> uh, but learn from it and so you don't repeat those mistakes and, and learn from others mistakes um, and prototyping uh, very crude prototyping even um, can go a long way oftentimes we have people saying well I want a prototype and I want it to look great Okay, well, show me what you've got so far. I don't have anything yet. This is just on the computer. It's like, okay, well, you should have at least a handful of iterations. Show me where you started from like a cardboard prototype. Like, I don't care. That's fine. You can do a lot with cardboard, you know, and, and glue and duct tape, a super glue and duct tape or hot glue. Um, but then, you know, call a professional model shop or product development house or engineering firm once you are have done you know, months of iterations and have had an engineer or a professional designer look at your product and give you their input. Um, don't hold it too close to your vest. You know, if, if you feel comfortable, like you have to have a non-disclosure agreement, fine. In my opinion, those aren't worth a whole lot. Um, you just, you need to be able to freely share information. And until you are at a point to have a patent, uh, you need to be with somebody you can trust, but you need to be able to share information for them to truly help you. So the point is to, 
if, when you're gonna you know learn from mistakes do it early when those prototypes are you know 10 bucks 20 bucks you know a hundred dollars not ten thousand dollars and when you've hired a professional who's five hundred dollars an hour two hundred fifty dollars an hour and that gets expensive and then you're not left any money left to try again okay i'd rather you'd rather try again once you've uh you know on your own and with your own kind of family and friends and then move on to the next level and you sometimes you do need funding uh and to and i think there's some people on here that have alluded to those resources today but you do need funding you know to get to get on shark tank to, to prototype those um you know, those products you know it's it's a five-figure investment you know a lot of times if not more uh so you do need money as you get into the later stages so just keep that in mind or you're going to have to give up a lot of sh the share in your product and now people are not many people are willing to do that once they become your ba your baby shifting gears a little bit um purdue not so much uh, on the entrepreneurship side i will say the purdue foundry does a lot of that and great stuff uh, but with my manufacturing extension partnership we work a lot with mostly much more mature companies however um, if you are a manufacturer in indiana and you have an ein and you are um, you have a NICS code, NAICS, um, that basically describes what sector you're in. Um, you qualify for 40 hours of no cost campus uh, consultation and project work each year, each calendar year, year over year, uh, as many times as you like. So these are more like R&D type projects. These can be special access to testing equipment that maybe only Purdue campus has that you would have to pay a lot of money for otherwise, you know, a lot of these types of projects can qualify uh, at no out of pocket cost other than the, the cost of your own time. Um, so that's one resource we do offer tap 40. Uh, I'll put that link up there in the, in the chat here momentarily, but we, we do start with a lot of early stage companies in that regard. Um, and then we do offer a lot of training, but um, some other groups I would, I would encourage you to, to contact um, Industrial Design Society of America, IDSA. They are the folks that, so an industrial designer, some people may not know what that is, but the, the person who basically designed the look of the Apple, any Apple product, um, that's, that's who an industrial designer is. It's a manufacturing artist, so to speak, but they're more than that. They solve problems. They solve, uh, you know, human interface, uh, user interface uh, problems and accessibility issues. So that it's a very broad category and a very cool job that a lot of people don't know about. Um, and so I always like to, to give them a shout out and they have some really talented folks that work with product development, um, you know, entrepreneurs regularly. Um, one other, uh, one last thing I will, if you are a more mature uh, company and looking to have something made, there are a lot of manufacturing marketplaces out there. Uh, but if you are looking to have more of a relationship and, and get somebody to, Give you honest feedback and work with you sort of off the clock a little bit to to get to refine your product um, we do supplier scouting as an mep organization which means we'll we'll throw up a description of what you're looking for to the, the nation uh, and the mep in, in each and every state looks at that and says oh i know somebody who makes that type of product or i know somebody that would be great to talk to and that's that's of no cost uh, that service so um, thanks for having me and uh look forward to hearing about the rest of uh everybody's talks. Thanks, Kyle. Um, I feel like product development is so far away from what I think about day to day. And it's, it's really interesting to think about all the resources that exist out there to uh, help folks in that realm. So, um, so I guess kind of going back to the idea of, you know, what does every entrepreneur or small business need to think about in that space? Where are they going to operate? And when is the right time? You know, can, is it something that can be done from home? Is it something that makes sense to lease a space or buy a space? And how do you figure out, you know, what options best for you and how do you negotiate that? And, and when should you make that decision? So we wanted to invite Catherine Esselman to talk a little bit about that and, and to provide some guidance and resources there. Thank you. Um, and Emmanuel, Kyle and Rhonda, I learned a lot. So thank you for um, uh, opening my eyes to, to allow resources I didn't know about. Um, I am Catherine Nesselman. Thank you for having me and happy Friday and happy Mother's Day to all who uh, have little people that you guys care for. Um, I am with Develop Indy, which is the economic development arm of the city of Indianapolis, which is housed within Indy Chamber. So that's just a lot of words to say that we try to encourage economic development in Indianapolis um, 
And my role specifically is, is working on the, within the built environment and thinking about more traditional retail, first floor, um, small manufacturing, just focusing on our, on our entrepreneurs and growing our um, small business community here in Indianapolis. My background is in commercial real estate. Um, in my entrepreneurial bend is that I had a small brokerage firm. So I represented um, owners of, of properties as well as small businesses looking to um, lease or purchase space. And I negotiated and, and represented their interests in, in that regard. Um, I come from a family of entrepreneurs in that, but, but all in, real, in the real estate space. Um, I also have worked for large, you know, publicly traded corporate real estate firms. So I say I cut my teeth learning uh, the ins and outs from, from the landlord perspective. Uh, but when I went on my own, I really felt drawn to helping um, smaller, you know, entities that, that don't get represented as much. Um, so tried to take some of the tricks that I learned and help to apply them uh, and represent interests. Um, for, for, for a more wide range of folks. Um, the, the title of the program about being competitive, that, that when I think of real estate and my role in that, it's kind of, I, I can connect to that because it's intimidating looking for office space or retail space or manufacturing space because it's not at all what people think about unless it's, unless it's what you do. Um, even to get your realtor or your broker's license is mostly about residential and there's not a lot of extra attention um, and, and education pay, paid to the commercial side of things. So as a, as a, I guess, a general statement, everyone deserves to have representation in their negotiations. And, um, and at the end of the day, if you're the tenant leasing space, you know, you have different set of goals and objectives than the landlord that's leasing the space. So. Um, knowing your uh, your worth and knowing your budget and knowing where you need to be will all help you narrow down the spots. Um, a, a, a trick that, <laughs> that we did when we worked with a larger retailer was we usually we'd go where you, where the competitor was. So we'd start our search for commercial real estate, you know, visible locations based on where the competitors are. So I'm trying to paint a very wide brush, not knowing all of the different businesses represented, but but thinking of your business and why you need that space and what that space will do for your business. Um, if you are working, you know, selling your products on, on Etsy or on just through Instagram and that's sufficient and you don't, you know, you're not to the place where you need a storefront, then, then keep doing that. To me, signing a lease or, or moving outside of your facility is, is, uh, is a growing pain. It's, it's a good sign that your business is growing and you need, to, you need more space. So that's indicative of of um, of budget planning and and knowing that that you can in that profit sharing or in your profits that there's enough set aside for additional rent. Um, but if you are really engaging with the public and and need that kind of walk up storefront traffic, you know you really need to be represented and and uh, be very thoughtful about how you approach your real estate decisions. Um, so what I do every day is uh, well especially this month, there's a program called Startup 317 that is housed at the Indie Chamber in partnership with Pattern. And it is a try before you buy type of program for retailers. Um, I work to secure the real estate. So we target first floor spaces that is that have been vacant, um, whether they are most you know, very recently vacant or have been vacant for a while. We work with those property owners and, and um, See if we can have it for a month. It's and it's now a long-term agreement. The the program is literally the month of May, and we open that up to um, applicants. And basically, there's a a form that you tell us how you would use the space or how your business would would use that space for one month. And I'm proud to say that we have 11 locations open right now for the month of May, uh, with over 30 brands and, and small uh, business, and I won't say small, but just businesses um, that are, are taking advantage of this opportunity. Um, I'll throw the, the link in there, but startup317.com. Um, but BOI, which is um, Business Ownership Initiative, which is housed at the Indie Chamber, um, also has a ton of resources that I'm, I would not be um, uh, 
I won't cover them all because I, I don't, but I'm going to put the links in there too. But there's um, lending opportunities and um, business coaching opportunities. And um, our, that, that in light of the past year, that, or, that entity within the chamber really pivoted and, and did a lot of um, funding, whether in grants or in loans or PPP. Um, and I think we did over $20 million and, and the majority of that went to um, local businesses that um, just needed that line. Uh, so we were really, uh, you know, we learned a lot in that time and um, I'll send the links there if that's still something that anybody wants to know more about. Thank you. Great, thanks Catherine. So I will use this moment to kind of put a plug in for the next uh, series in this session um, on June 2nd. So obviously, um, or sorry, June 4th, um, you know, we've heard multiple times today that, you know, capital is important and which is not surprising, but figuring out how to get it can, can be very challenging and who to get it from and what you're eligible for. So our next series on June 4th will actually feature a number of different small business lenders, um, folks in the government financing space um, and others to kind of share information on some of those small business um, capital programs that might actually um, kind of speak to some of the needs that were discussed today. So appreciate everyone giving an overview of what they uh, do and what they have to offer within their organizations and some of the programs that are available. And then um, now I just want to pivot a little bit and ask folks a few questions. So um, I have a few questions kind of prepared, but would definitely encourage you guys to uh, drop any questions in the chat that we can kind of uh, work in in the next uh, 25 minutes or so before we wrap up. So my first question um, is for uh, Dr. Taylor. So um, what are the benefits of getting a certificate in entrepreneurship and when's the right time to do that? So if a business is, you know, if, if someone is just at that ideation stage of like, I think I want to start a business, I think I want it to be X, Y, and Z, is that the right time? Or is it better once a business maybe has been operating a little bit and they kind of understand some of the dynamics of what it takes or does it matter? It really doesn't matter. We have all, all kinds of people from, I just woke up this morning and thought I want to start a business to individuals that have actually been operating their business for two or three years and they're ready to scale or they realize that they need to pivot and they're not really sure how to do that. Um, and so the advantage of our program is we literally meet you where you are and then we help to bring you to that next level. Now, sometimes we may have to back you up because, you know, like I started my business very incorrectly and, uh, you know, was on the brink of actually being illegal. And thank God I met someone that was able to help me say, uh, let's, let's go in this direction. So sometimes we have to back it up a couple of steps and then bring you forward. But it really doesn't matter. Um, one of the biggest advantage to actually having the certificate itself is um, for those that are looking at, um, especially if you're changing industries or professions and you want the skill base as well as the knowledge on how to operate a business. So for instance, I'm going to start a restaurant. Okay. And I was like, okay, great. Do you have your safe serve? Um, no. All right. Are you a chef? Um, no. Well, let's, let's get some more information on that and let's help you out. So we have an excellent hospitality program that you can get a certificate in as little as, you know, two semesters, or you can go for the entire associates if that's what you want to do. So we can stack those together to build a nice little program. So you get both the skill that you, that you need that information, as well as the um, information on how to actually run the business with the entrepreneurship. So um, we, we take just about anyone that, you know, is, is ready to do that. And it doesn't matter the timing. Great, thanks. Um, so next question for Catherine. So, um, you know, whenever you mentioned, you know, how much can I, how much in my budget as a business owner can I pay for space? And so I think people can easily wrap their head around that rent number or that okay. mortgage number, but what are some of the other costs that a business should be thinking about when they're going to lease a space that they may not have on their radar? Uh, the condition of the building that you are targeting. So um, the build out cost is um, a uh, wide ballpark number and the type of landlord that you're going to be renting your space from is also a, a huge variable. Um, I can use a lot of words, but the <laughs> we looked at it as um, your, your operating expenses. So not only your base rent that you're paying per month, per square feet, 
but your utility costs and your insurance costs and um, you know the the in light of the last year you know PPE expenses and and cleaning and um, especially you know this front facing um, storefront engaging with the public it's just a more expensive operation um, because of how it presents it's not just you know your garage in the back that you know in, that, that you can that no one else is going to see um, that's going to be much uh, um, much more cost effective than than a, a spot uh, within the fashion mall or or on Broderpool Avenue um, so really trying to match who's going to be using the space um, with the type of space that you end up needing um, the uh, occupancy cost is another number that's kind of all in. So depending on, this is where a, a broker or having someone represent your interests is really important because they'll tell you a net number or a gross number, meaning that net is kind of a la carte. You pay each thing as a line item. So there's a number for your, your base rent plus your insurance plus your taxes and what they call common area maintenance. So you're paying a portion of plowing the sidewalk and you know just the, what it costs to maintain the building. The landlord will generally pass on to the tenants of the space. So in that negotiation is the perfect time to really ask all of those questions. Is it, are you going to bill me back for every single thing or is it just one number that I'm going to pay you each month for budgeting? I always try to push for gross rents for budgeting purposes so that there isn't a fluctuation that you know Every month, I got to set aside five hundred dollars, or I have to make that that thousand dollars in my first weekend. You know, the, trying to get that rent coverage paid for in the first week of the month or the last. You know what I mean? That that you're planning ahead accordingly. Um, yes, and where your where your customers are. So knowing who's who your customers are will help you determine which real estate you need um, and how to hit how to maximize that and be essentially located where you have your existing customer base, but then how are you going to attract new customers, which is usually a key motivator for why you want physical space is to attract more uh, wide in your audience. So um, it's definitely not something to rush into, um, but if you're looking for space, I suggest spending a lot of time driving around looking at space, right? If, if there's a spot that you that keeps catching your eye saying, if only I could be in this space, manifest that figure that out you know who owns it how you would get there um if it is available if, it, if there's a broker but i would i would truly recommend doing your research before contacting a broker or asking for representation it shows you're ready right that you've done your research that you know what it is that you're asking them to do um i'd be remiss if i didn't talk about compensation for representation that is what the landlord that the property owner pays that on your as, as a portion of the uh, the deal that's negotiated, the lease that is that is signed between the tenant and the landlord. Um, so the the broker or the real estate agent wants to know you're serious, right? Because they're investing in you just as to represent you and and help to get you to the finish line where you're signing a lease. Um, so the more prepared you are before that initial conversation, the the better that relationship will be, and it will yield you much better results in the long term. Great, thank you. So um, next question might be more for Rhonda or Emmanuel. So whoever wants to chime in, but um, Emmanuel, you mentioned some of the kind of mistakes and Rhonda, you did too about that, you know, businesses kind of overlook things or they might be doing things illegally. And I'm just kind of curious, you know, what are some of the most common things that people overlook when they're first starting out, not realizing that they have to do? And also if you could speak to, I think sometimes when a business realizes like, they haven't been doing their taxes right, or they didn't get a license or certificate they needed, just how best to approach that? Because I think there's a lot of times there's this fear wrapped up. Well, if I go and try to fix it or let someone know that I'm going to get in trouble. And so what would you suggest folks think about when they kind of need to, to rectify some of those things that they've overlooked? You're on mute, Emmanuel. Here I go. Uh, yes. Yeah, so um, one thing that, um, you know, I, I really um, 
you know, stress with, with my entrepreneurs is we have to do um, our, our marketing research or this research period, you know, about your industry, you know, what licenses or certifications uh, that you need. Uh, I have a lot of entrepreneurs who uh, are in the food service business, but they're still cooking out of their house. And it's like, no, you can't do that. You have to, you know, uh, either have a restaurant or have a commissary and or share a kitchen, you know? So those are kind of some of the issues. Also, you know, with the food service business, you have to have at least uh, somebody that has their serve say food manager, you know? So, you know, that, that is one uh, certification that we do offer here at Edna Martin and, and at Ivy Tech, you know? So just, just you know, doing that, the, the, the groundwork and doing the research. Uh, I think a lot of us just kind of just skip over that uh, because, you know, we have a great idea or somebody said that we can cook real good. So if you can cook real good, go ahead and start a business. But, you know, there are, you know, the licenses, uh, but also the, the permits uh, and, and, and the fees that are attached to them. You know, with the food service business, you have to get your health department's license. Uh, you have to get, if you are in a shared kitchen or commissary, you have to get that license. If you're a food truck, you have to get your food truck license. So, you know, these are things that, you know, a lot of individuals you know, may miss uh, in the process, but it's definitely uh, crucial and critical, you know, that you have these licenses uh, because they can shut you down, especially the, the health department. So uh, we just, you know, encourage everyone just to do everything right uh, and in order. Uh, of course, we can't force anybody. We're not going to just, you know, call the health department and say, hey, this person is doing this and that. Uh, but, you know, we, we warn them and just let them know that, you know, somebody or, or a neighbor can call on you and they can, you know, shut you down, especially if you are cooking and, and serving you know, uh, um, out of your house. So we just want to want to encourage everyone, everybody, you know, to do the best that they can, but also do it right and do it right the first time. Because when you don't do it right the first time, it's either more labor, uh, more money, more time, you know, that, that you have to invest. So, you know, that's what we kind of do this, encourage them to do the right thing. So I um, agree with that 100%. For me, it was more so the ta taxes and finance. And um, there's so many things that you just don't know about and unseen things that you have to make sure you're doing for um, your business. And for me, when I hired employees and I had a payroll company, there were certain things that either I just didn't understand or I, I didn't know to do it, um, but it landed me a big fat audit with the IRS. So <laughs> that was a little scary, but um, for me, I learned that I just needed to hire an accountant to help me with, with those things because, you know, I was a, a one woman show and I had a lot going on and it was easier for me. And I had the money to pay someone to do some of those things that, you know, was just escaping me so that I didn't end up in jail because I don't look good in orange. But the big thing is, you know, don't be afraid to hire someone to help you in those areas legally, accounting and, and marketing and, and do some research for you. Um, that's what your startup cost is all about. You include those fees and, and, and things in there so that you can pay um, those individuals. Unfortunately, that's one of the big things that a lot of brand new entrepreneurs will skimp on because they don't have enough funding to go around to pay. And those are very critical. They definitely can help, you know, take your business to the next level and keep you from having to pay more than that in fees later on. Uh -huh. And, and for me, real quick, uh, you know, so I, I had to deal with the with the tax situation. You know, I, I wasn't uh, filing my taxes uh, on a monthly basis, uh, and, and it did catch up with me. You know, so uh, and just with, within my business, I had a, a big fat five thousand dollar debt. You know, that that I owed um, in the state of Indiana. So uh, from from just hands on experience, and you know, at this time that I, I wasn't as adverse. Or you know, very knowledgeable about um, about business and, and everything uh, about ten years ago. So uh, you know, I, I, I've been there, uh, and I just encourage everybody: pay your taxes. So um, I want to go back to a comment Kyle mentioned, and Kyle, I know you're not necessarily an intellectual property lawyer or anything, but um, you know. I think I've encountered a few entrepreneurs before who think they need a patent or they think they need a, um, a, um, a trademark or copyright. And um, I guess you kind of mentioned, you know, at some point in the journey in developing a product, uh, you know, figuring out when's the right time to do that. And I think sometimes it, to the extent you can even speak to it, you know, kind of when should somebody seek what or when does something apply as opposed to not? Yeah. I think, uh, 
I think when you're at when you're at the stage of sending out, um, and I'll stick with hardware. Uh, if you're sending out CAD files, computer aided design, 3D files, drawings, blueprints to manufacturers, to as contract manufacturers or your sole uh, manufacturer, you're going to use for bids. Um, that's you definitely want uh, an NDA in place um, with those folks, um, especially you know overseas. You know has a has a reputation for a reason uh, of stealing uh, IP uh, from the U.S. So be very careful when you deal with overseas because the costs can look good, but there are there are other factors to um, uh, that play in there. So definitely at that point. And then before that, you know, it's kind of, I would get the opinion of some others that you trust, whether this is, you know, groundbreaking or, um, you know, this is, this is going to be something that people are going to knock off immediately. Or if this is kind of like, yeah, I mean, it, it has to be novel. That's the first, like one of the first things I think a patent attorney will tell you, it's got to be unique and novel. And um, that's about as far as I'll speak about patent attorneys uh, and patents, but um, there are some free resources too. If you want to get, if you're set on getting a patent and you're ready for that, I know IU Law, the students, if you can be patient with that program, they will great, do it at a much uh, redu a greatly reduced rate compared to what you'd pay retail at a $500 an hour firm. So for what that's worth. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I think when you, definitely when you're sharing your IP, which is your own designs that are unique, you, you want to have something in place there. And then when you go to work with a manufacturer's rep or whomever is representing you to get those bids, um, you need to communicate clearly to them that, um, you know, this is, you know, for your eyes only. I'm not sharing this with the world. If you trust this person, maybe we don't need an NDA in place because my design is still evolving, but um, you want to start getting some quotes for some ballparks for you, you need to know how much your, your, your product's going to cost. You know, you need to work backwards. Well, this is my material cost. This is what I think labor is going to cost. So I'm going to charge this at wholesale or I'm going to charge this direct at retail or whatever it is. So you need to have some costs in there. And I wouldn't wait till you're done, done to, to do that. Um, so, so yeah, I would work with some people that, that you trust and don't send it out to the world. And, uh, um, you know, look at some domestic sources because there's a lot of manufacturing coming back to the States and uh, for, for many reasons, as we've seen, if you try to buy anything these days, it's crazy. But uh, <laughs> from houses to, uh, to lumber to, you know, anything in between, but, um, you know, having a, a local supply chain is, is important. So um, I encourage you to, to do that as well. So I've taken up the floor asking a lot of questions. So I'm going to turn it back to our panelists to see if they have any questions for each other, especially for, um, I know some of you mentioned hearing some, some resources for the first time. And if you don't, I will come up with some more. <laughs> um, I guess I'll ask a question of Kyle. I'm excited about um, the work that you do with um, the prototyping. And uh, while I haven't had um, many students that are in that arena just yet, I just know it's going to happen. And I'm scared to death of it because I don't have a resource. So do you work with individuals that, you know, just starting out with that? And, and what does that look like um, for you know, maybe um, someone like a student of Ivy Tech going through that? Yeah, um, I used to uh, in, back in the private sector world. I don't so much these days, but uh, um, yeah, there are still uh, you know, people out there that do help, and I, I can be happy to, to give you that list offline, um, depending on where they're at and what kind of what they need more, whether it's engineering help or design help or just making the thing. Um, like I said, the, the, one of the first places to start would be like a local makerspace, and, and I'm partial to 3D printing, but there's a lot of other cool resources, whether it's uh, textiles, whether it's, um, you know, metal forming, um, you know, casting, pottery, um, you know, any of these kind of trades and, and, and crafts people that are, um, you know, really kind of making a, a, you know, a comeback and have been for a while now. But uh, um, there's a lot of good resources here locally in, in Indianapolis, greater surrounding area. Um, the second stop would be kind of the, the smaller universities, Ivy Tech, you know, uh, I mentioned the Purdue Polytechnics, Typically, it's kind of like working with a bank. You hear a lot about work with the small local banks. It's the truth when it comes to developing your product. 
um, it's a lot harder to go knock on West Lafayette's door and say, like, I got a, I got a great idea. Uh, it, you'll get a lot further, honestly, if you go to like New Albany or Anderson or Richmond or West Lafayette Polytechnic, because it, it's more hands on. It's, it's they have a lot of great equipment still. And it's just a much smaller, um, you know, more intimate setting and you'll get the, the attention you need sooner, I believe. So that's kind of where I'd start. But yeah, happy to share those resources once they're looking to go the professional route. Usually that is needed unless you're just a really talented person. Um, you need somebody to help you kind of create that uh, that really photo ready prototype uh, to uh, hopefully gain some um, you know, investors during a pitch or a Kickstarter campaign or however you're choosing to, to fund your project. Excellent. Thank you. Yeah, I look forward to getting that information because paper mache dolls are not making it for us. So <laughs> appreciate you. <laughs> You know, and sometimes on the prototyping side of things, I know I don't have a lot of experience there, but I know, um, you know, and a, a few years ago, you know, there was a um, someone who, you know, very unique situation where someone wanted to make, you know, a, a doll for an American girl doll um, hand for a, a child that had um, uh, a birth, uh, you know, she was born differently with, with in terms of how her fingers and, and hand was, was, um, was formed and so she wanted a doll that looked like her so we worked with several different prototyping companies one that did a 3d scan of the little girl's arm and another one that actually was able to build something and so sometimes there may be um may not be all the skills in house to actually develop that but it, it you know that wasn't necessarily something that was going to be scaled broadly it was kind of a one-off project but you know there's other circumstances where you have these different resources that can come together to kind of create that product even if and, and maybe in a more collaborative and affordable way than if you, you know, went to a large company right off the bat. So I think we have about two minutes left. I don't know if anyone has a final question they'd like to ask. I know a few of us have a hard stop maybe. And I just would echo the going local with landlords and property owners is also a, a good rule of thumb. Um, connect with your uh, you know, in your neighborhood, in if you have a local CDC, a development organization, and if you know, I would, I would start local before you try to, to grow too big. I'll make some plugs real quick. Um, currently we have a, um, uh, campaign going on for um, raising funds for our entrepreneurs that are graduating uh, this semester. So we're looking to raise $20,000 so that we can help um, give them seed money for their business. And I'll drop the link in the, the chat if anyone's interested in sharing the link or even contributing. We appreciate that. And then secondly, we're having our um, annual Ivy Shark Tank in June, July, excuse me, it's gonna be July 14th from 5.30 p.m. to 9.30 p.m. Um, at the downtown campus. And uh, again, it's for all Ivy Tech students, um, but we opened it up to the general public to come in and peruse the booths and see um, you know, what they like if they wanna purchase something or just you know, enjoy the, um, the Shark Tank. So those, that's something that we have coming up in the summer. Great, well, we look forward to uh, helping share information about those things and, and participate. So thank you all for your time today, uh, for those joining on Zoom or Facebook and our speakers. Um, I hope everyone's found a little nugget that can be useful to them and their respective um, and their work. And so appreciate your partnership and, and our partners at The Recorder and uh, Interpower for, for hosting this event with us today. All right, thank you.